Thank you, Steve. We all know that communication is extremely important. At the very least, it involves two parties at a given time, one to act as a transmitter and the other as the receiver. Face-to-face -face communication, however, has a problem with the distance. If you try to tell me something, you better be within my hearing distance, unless, of course, I'm a superhero, but most of us are not. So uh, as the distance grows, we need to rely on some additional helps, often involving other species at the expense of the latency. Fortunately, our ancestors have mastered several techniques to establish real-time information transfer. So instead of our voice and our ears, we rely on our eyes and, and have the information converted in, into some sort of coded message. While it's quite a stretch, we can view semaphore, fire beacons, and smoke signals as the earliest primitive forms of uh, free space optical communication. Now, unfortunately, friendly atmospheric conditions and, of course, excellent sight are necessary for these techniques to work. Fortunately, the next logical step was quite also aspiring. So what if the receiver doesn't need to observe the signal from a distance? What if the information itself is projected to the receiver? And this is why heliograph was invented. Uh, a focused light, uh, typically from the uh, sunlight, carries the information, that coded message, and projects it to the location close to the receiver. Sometimes we use Morse code for decoding. Decoding Morse code, however, wasn't fun. So this is where Alexander Graham Bell, best known for inventing the telephone, came up with the idea of photophone. Now, Bell was extremely fascinated with photophone. He thinks this is his best invention ever. He even almost named his daughter, second daughter, after it. Unsuccessfully, of course, thanks to his wife's common sense. In Bell's photophone setup in the transmitter, his voice modulates the optical signals, typically, again, the sunlight, and then it's sent down to the receiver where it gets back or converted again to audio signals. This is exactly like telephone, but instead of electricity, Bell was using light. So even with the technology available in the, in the 1880, Bell and his assistant managed to transfer voice via light over a distance of 700 feet. So this is quite remarkable. This is a milestone in the history of wireless voice communication. Unfortunately, uh, both heliograph and photophone fall into the category of free space communication. So it, has, it suffers from two problems. First, a line of set is crucial. Second, the medium itself is not friendly. It's very lossy. It's not surprised that it's hard to establish a long uh, communication link over a great distance. So no wonder. Electricity won the battle for a while. People forgot about optical communication. Telegraph and telephone took the, the world by storm, and radio communication became the most dominant form of uh, wireless communication for the next 100 years. It wasn't until 50 years ago that optical communication gained traction again. And it was because of the invention of laser. Now, if you grew up in the 90s and a big fan of comic books, you know that laser is amazing. <laughs> in real life, however, laser is much more than just this powerful and destructive weapon. Light coming out of laser is different than any other light source. For a start, it's highly monochromatic. It exhibits one single pure color. So if you pass it to a prism, there won't be any rainbow of colors behind it. That also means that all the photons are in the same frequency and they carry the same energy. Laser is also coherent. All the rays, they don't cross each other as they travel. And on top of that, uh, the wavefronts wave front are in perfect sync. As I will explain later, this is an, a necessary condition to establish optical interference. Turn out that by being monochromatic and being coherent, this sets laser up as the perfect carrier for optical communication. Another achievement that we have done is fiber optic. It's made of silica glass, it's very light, it's low cost in the maintenance, and it's pretty much difficult to tamper with. In pretty much all aspects, it's much superior than copper wire. If you uh, cut the fiber optic cable, it looks like this. The jacket and the buffer are there definitely for the protection, but the magic happens inside the core itself. If you take a strand of your hair, the thinnest part is 17 micron, but the fiber optic core is just 8 micron. And thanks to the differences in the refractive index between the core and the cladding, this established an optical phenomenon known as the total internal reflection. In other words, once you launch a photon inside that silica glass of 8 micron, it doesn't go anywhere. And thanks to the modern fabrication technology, the loss of modern optical fiber is just about 0.2 point uh, decibel per kilometer. In plain English, it means that a single photon can travel a distance of 62 miles before it just retains 1% of its power. But with modern technology, 1% of the power is all necessary to recover the signal back. Now, think about this. 
a fiber optic transmission of 62 miles. That's roughly between San Jose and San Francisco without any additional power booster or amplifier. Take that copper wire. <laughs> so this is why our internet backbones run on this network of undersea fiber optic cable all over the world. In fact, a lot of people would not be able to watch this keynote via live streaming if not for millions of photons flying around in these tiny little tubes. So if you think of internet as a series of tubes, <laughs> there is some truth to it, isn't it? So if we pick one of these trans authentic cable, T8014, that has been used for more than a decade, we can see that the capacity is humongous. This cable has two, so two routes, south and north, each carries four fibers. In each fiber, there's a transmission of 10 gigabit per second. Not only one, but 40 of them. Total capacity is 3.2 terabit per second. So to imagine this, think about the stack of Blu-ray discs, a bunch of them, whose content got zapped somewhere in Europe, and then magically appear somewhere in East Coast, all in just one second. This is a huge amount of data. How do you see if this amazing transmission uh, ability? Well, nothing more than modulation. Many, many times ago, Bell had only amplitude analog modulation at his disposal, but this day we can modulate the amplitude, frequency, and phase of the optical signal, typically the, the laser uh, light source. Now, Phase modulation, here's the key. This is dreams come true for any uh, opti communication expert. Why? Because thanks to laser being coherent, we can force the, the signal to interfere with, uh, with each other. This diagram shows two different formation, maybe one and zero, encoded in different amplitude and frequency and phase. With phase, we can just ask the signal to interfere with itself. So if they're different, they will cancel each other. If they're the same, they will amplify each other. This leads us to a highly sensitive, high quality optical receiver that allows us to push the line rate to one gigabit per second or 10 gigabit, gigabit per second, as you have seen earlier. But it's even better. Since laser is monochromatic, we can modulate multiple signal in different frequency or colors. This diagram shows four different channels, all in the same fiber optic cable. No need to change the installation at all. But Practically, you can have as many as 40 or even more. This effectively multiplies the transmission capacity of that 8 micron of fiber, silica glass. So no wonder we can achieve this amazing transmission capacity. So, however, nothing is perfect, not even in the optical land. There's no unicorn double rainbows. So there's a lot of optical impairments uh, that as soon as we get to much higher transmission capacity, that becomes more important because it may uh, degrade the signal quality. Take, for example, dispersion. This causes pulse broadening so that one, one signal that is adjacent to, uh, to each other will, will not be easily distinguishable anymore, and that presents a problem for the demo later. But rest assured, some of the brightest men in our industry, everyone from scientist to material designer, are working collaboratively very, very hard in order to solve this problem, and the results speak for itself. So we already see 10 gigabit per second that we enjoy, probably without realizing it. Why stop at 10? We also have 100 and 200. With this, we can maximize the transmission capacity to a staggering number of 31 terabit per second. In fact, a few months ago, scientists have shown that if we start to improve the medium itself, change the fiber optic, then we can get a staggering capacity even more. 255 terabit per second. That's crazy. Imagine this. It was barely 150 years ago that Alexander Graham Bell was struggling with analog modulation, low quality, short distance. And now, this is what we enjoy. Are we going to see petabit per second, exabit per second anytime soon? Only time will tell. So, if you know someone, a family member, a friend, anyone who is a scientist, Give them a hug, a big hug. They may work on a future innovation that changes the way we communicate. In fact, without them, I will not be here today. You won't be there today. Our job will not exist. In fact, without them, we won't enjoy this ubiquitous, high capacity, low latency internet communication connection all over the world, whether it's for a group of leaders trying to you know, improve our civilization and make the world a better place, or just a kid somewhere trying to learn programming for an online course. We need to always remember but we that we stand on the sword of the giants, the men and the women before us. It is therefore in our best interest to show our gratitude 
to be thankful and to stay humble. Thank you.